Hey friends, this is my 1971 Fender Champ that I bought off of David Olney quite a while back. David uh, was a singer-songwriter who passed away last winter, and he was a friend of mine. And I'll tell you a little more about him here in a little bit, but um, I've always loved these amps. I had one when I was about 19 years old. Back then, you used to be able to go to yard sales, you know, pawn shops, flea markets, and you'd find these for 25 or 30 dollars. They just weren't very popular in the 80s. They'd fallen out of favor, but I always loved them. And uh, so I had one and I used to use it just as a bedroom amp. You know, I'd practice on it and play on it. And I really dug it. But a buddy of mine taught me how to drive a stick shift in his Ford Pinto at about 4.30 a.m. at Mr. D's parking lot on the south side of Indianapolis. And uh, he didn't have a, he was actually a better guitar player than me. And a dear friend and he didn't have an amp so I just went ahead and gave him mine and I didn't have one for years after that and it was always in the back of my head it's like man I'd like to buy you know another Fender Champ and uh, the value went up a little bit as the years went on but I was at my buddy Sergio Webb's house dear friend one of my favorite people and we were talking about champs just having to bring it up and man he had one it was amazing. It was really loud, sounded great, and it was Chris Scruggs first guitar amp, first one he ever had. Somehow Sergio ended up with it, and I'm like, Sergio, you gotta sell that to me. And he's like, no, nah, I can't get rid of it. It was Chris's, and I'm like, all right, that's cool. So uh, I, he said, well, you know, David Olney has one, and Sergio was playing with David Olney at that time. So I talked to David, and He's like, yeah, I'll get rid of it. I'll sell it to you for $200 if you want. And I said, yeah, I'd like to buy that. And, um, and uh, I bought it from him. I said, hey, man, tell me something about it. Tell me a little bit about it. And uh, he got it at a music store somewhere in rural North Carolina. And he played on it forever. He claimed Towns Van Zant once played this amp. And, uh, I have no idea if that's true, but I'm going to perpetuate that myth as much as possible if it is. I like to think of uh, David's mojo and Towns' mojo having that. David was a great singer-songwriter who was buddies with Towns Van Zant and Guy Clark. He had his songs covered by people like, you know, and recorded, he had his songs recorded by people like Emmy Lou Harris, Del McCurry, Steve Earle, um, Linda Ronstadt. He had quite a few cuts and, uh, um, did a few albums on Rounder Records and Philo, and he's actually on Austin City Limits once. If you search here on YouTube, you can find his set from Austin City Limits back when. But man, he put out a ton of records. He just kept releasing and he kept touring. We played a lot of the same gigs over in Europe, but I became friends with him through Sergio and my buddy Tom Yutz. Those are two of my favorite people in the world, Tom and Sergio, and they both played with David for quite a while. That's kind of how I got to know David. But um, he was a little bit of a guy that was afraid to have too fancy a gear because he was afraid he might leave it somewhere. I guess he was a little bit uh, absent-minded sometimes and would leave things sitting around. There's a story that I heard about him years ago. He got a job in Memphis where he was supposed to hang a bunch of abstract artwork all over this hotel and every room of the hotel. And he went ahead and he hung his abstract artwork. It's an important part of the story. He hung every painting in the hotel upside down. And uh, they made him go back and turn it back over the other way. But I guess he claimed it was so abstract he couldn't tell which end was up. But um, David also had a 125 a Gibson 125 that I wanted. It was an arch top with the one P90 dog ear in it. I think it's the late 50s. And I loved that. And I asked him a dozen times, you know, hey man, if you ever want to get rid of that, sell it to me. I'd love to have that. And um, he's like, yeah, man, I'll think about it. But he was digging at the time. He ended up getting rid of that. He sold it to my buddy, Lynn Taylor. And um, somehow Lynn ended up with Chris Scruggs champ also. So I guess Lynn is much better at talking people into doing things than, than I am. So much love to you, Lynn, if you're out there. 
So I'll play a little bit. I'll play a little bit for you. I've always loved these amps. I think they sound great. They're on so many recordings. So many people have recorded with these amps. Earlier versions of this is what Joe Walsh used on Funk Forty Nine. Clapton used on you know Layla and a bunch of his earlier stuff. Supposedly George Harrison played through a silver face like this on something, and uh, there's just so many recordings. They're great recording amps, and uh, and they're great for just sitting around the house and playing. But I'll play a little bit. I'm uh, I don't have a dirt pedal at all. I have a a little slap back delay playing through this, and you'll hear a little bit of reverb from the room. There's a lot of wood floors and high ceilings and a lot of reflective surfaces, but I really dig this. And, and uh, oh yeah, Keith uh, Keith Richards has been known to to love these chants. So, uh... <laughs> It sounds great how it resonates. I love that sound. That overdrive is just perfect. It's um, it's a great lesson when you play through these because uh, small tube amps are really responsive, where you can play lighter, you know, you... and it doesn't break up. It's a little bit cleaner, and you get on it and. love the sound of it but uh i've played uh with a band with this but i don't like loud drummers so i'm not gonna play it with anybody who's super super loud i've played solo gigs where i would have this thing sitting on the floor and i couldn't hear it and i'm the only one on stage so i just couldn't hear it enough if you set it up on a chair it's better when i played with a band we did a bunch of rehearsals and um i had it up on a road case so it was up by my head and it sounded great it was just about this far away from me and i could hear it really well and we were going to play a festival it was me and sergio uh, my buddy rob price and uh, joe Giona. he's a great drummer and it says a lot where i could play a champ over him and he sounded great that says a lot to how gr good a drummer he is but um i was going to use this for this outdoor festival it was a really really big stage and I just wanted to be able to say I played a big outdoor festival through a Fender Champ, just plugging straight into it. But when I got there, you know, the changeovers at those festivals are just ridiculous, and everybody needs to have their stuff together. And um, I don't know that it was going to be right. I would have had them put it into the monitors. And at the last minute, they had this beautiful blackface deluxe as the back line. So I went ahead and thought about it and thought, man, I'm just going to play through that and make it easier on everybody. The sound crew there probably appreciated that. They were working hard enough, and they're usually more talented than anybody on stage, and they definitely work harder than the people on stage, so I wanted to make their lives easier. So it's a 1971 Silver Face Champ. I checked online this morning, and there's been a bunch that have recently sold for, you know, around $450 to $500 seems to be about what they're going for right now. You know, the day I recorded this. And there's some people that have paid 700 or a little more than that. I'm guessing they were perfect. This, this is a little something about David. I think this says a lot about him. But when I checked it out originally, you know, the speaker was crap. There might I think it was a Radio Shack speaker in it. And so I just looked at it and I thought, all right, I'm going to have to change that. I'm going to have to replace it. And um, he sold it to me for $200. And I, I knew that going into it. That's that's under value already. You know, he's, he gave me a good deal on it. So I replaced the speaker. I called uh, Weber's and I, uh, you know, Kokomo, Indiana, Weber Speakers. It's great that we have some of the best speakers in the world made right here in Indiana. 
I called them up, told them what I had, said, what should I put in it? And they asked me a few questions, you know, how do you like to play and yada yada. And they suggested one, put it in here and it just sounded great. I mean, just great. The speaker made so much difference. Tightened up the low end and uh, it just sounded great. It's an eight inch speaker in these. The speaker that I bought was very heavy, had a heavy magnet, so it kind of doubled the weight of the amp, but it's still light. But um, word got back to David that I had changed the speaker in it. And he was feeling weird about that, so he contacted me. And the next, next time I saw him, he's like, Otis, um, I feel bad that you had to change that speaker in there. And, uh, and he started offering to give me money back because he was afraid that he, he ripped me off or he sold me something defective or whatever. I was like, David, you don't owe me anything, man. You sold this to me underpriced. But he was ready to give me money back for that. And I think that says a lot about David. He, he wanted to make sure we had a fair deal. And um, I appreciate that about him. But David passed away on stage at a gig in Florida not too long ago. I kept hearing people say, you know, that's a perfect way for the performer to go. David was known for being a great performer. And um, they kept saying, that's a perfect way for a performer to go. And man, I, I hated hearing that. Every time I heard that, it just made me mad. It's like, that's a terrible way to go. You know, you want to be surrounded by the people who love you the most. You don't want to be on stage. You know, you want to be with your family, with your friends, you know, with the, you know, with your wife. You want to be with your kids, you know, if you have a choice in it. And um, I, so that bothered me. There's just so much like bullshit rock and roll mythology that we all buy into and we need to lose all of that. And, uh, but I heard that David's wife was there and, you know, it made me feel a lot better. He got a ton of national and international press afterwards. Just every outlet that could report on something reported on David passing away. I wish that they would have taken the time to report and review on his last few albums. That would have helped him an awful lot. He deserved all of that press when he passed away, but, you know, he deserved to have people pay attention to his albums when they're being released also. But um, I encourage you to go check out David's music if you've never heard him before. There's an album called Deeper Well that he did, you know, back when, maybe back in the 80s. And uh, it's kind of his little breakthrough album. That's a good place to start. But there's so many great records later on. I think that one was on Rounder Records and it's a good place to start. And uh, I encourage you to go check it out. There's a lot of good clips on YouTube, but um, I will play a little more of this amp and uh, lead you out. You get to hear the amp that Towns Van Zant once played through. Thank you guys very much for listening to this. Go check out David's music. Go get you a champ if you think you might like it and subscribe, comment, like. If you dig uh, David's music, you have a favorite one of his songs, tell me about it in the comments. I'd love to hear about that. And uh, if you have a chant, tell me about it. Tell me how you like to play it. What dirt pedal do you like running through it? I just like plugging straight into it, but some of you guys like overdrives and dirt pedals. Tell me about it. Tell me about some more history of the champ if you want to. I'd love to hear it. Thank you guys and take care. <laughs>